Yeah, so um, thank, thank you everybody for coming tonight. Um, this is part of our virtual series, um, Caribou Trails. And if you're not aware, you're probably aware that we're, right now we have three, um, three pre presentations lined up. One of them was last week, one of them's tonight, and we have another one about caribou diseases on Monday night. We will have the link in the chat room for that, but you can also find it on our social media pages. And um, I just want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Um, as we do the presentation, I'm going to ask everybody to have their cameras and their um, audio off. And um, we'll, any questions that you have, you can throw it in the chat box and we'll save that for the end. We're going to do a, kind of a variety here. We're going to have a sh the video, um, Counting Caribou. If you haven't seen that, it's a 10-minute video. And I'm going to show that video just to give you an overall sense of the process out in the field of um, taking photo, like taking photos of the herd, what it looks like, and kind of set the stage for the uh, presentation that is going to follow that. And Nate Pamperin, the the photo census coordinator, is going to give more of an in-depth presentation about the mechanics and the cameras and the process of doing the caribou photo census. Um, and then after he does that, I'm going to show a short video about the. Um, the main airplane that gets used, the, the Heavlin Beaver, and Tom Seaton is here. He's the photo census pilot, and he's featured in that short video, but he's also here to talk and to answer questions about anything about the photo census as well. So that's kind of the way we're going to run it here tonight. Um, when I start this video, I'm going to share my screen. When I start the video, if anybody doesn't have good bandwidth at home or they have some troubles, there is a link right now. Uh, to the YouTube channel. So when I click on, when I'm showing it through my computer, if you're having trouble viewing it, if it's not streaming or, or if it's uh, not running properly, click on the YouTube link and YouTube um, should be more aligned to your bandwidth. So you can watch it on YouTube while we're watching it on the computer. Um, and Jen or Sierra, did I miss anything or should I go ahead and start? Hi, this is Mike Tarras with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and I'm here today to introduce a short video about how we count caribou. One of the most important aspects of wildlife management is knowing how many animals there are in a given area. This knowledge is fundamental to creating hunting regulations that ensure sustainable harvest and long-term conservation of a species. Figuring out how many animals are on the landscape is a difficult task, however, especially given the size and remoteness of Alaska. Each wildlife species offers its own challenges and requires a different method of estimating numbers. Caribou provide us with a unique counting opportunity. Each year in the summertime, if the weather conditions and insects cooperate, caribou form into large groups in open tundra and alpine areas. This provides biologists with an opportunity to take aerial photographs of these groups. In wildlife management, this is as close to a complete count or a census that's possible for any of our wildlife species. While this video may make it look like a simple task, make no mistakes, getting these images of caribou aggregations is a real challenge. It takes a lot of people, a lot of time, a lot of flying, a lot of waiting, and a lot of luck to pull off a photo census of just one of Alaska's more than 30 caribou herds. Come along for the next 10 minutes as we provide a glimpse of how we count caribou and give you a bird's eye view of a wildlife phenomena that few people ever get to see. Large herds of caribou migrating across vast landscapes are one of Alaska's greatest natural resources. These caribou are a key part of the ecosystem, foraging on plants and providing food for scavengers, predators, and humans alike. If nature cooperates, 
One time each year, a team of biologists with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game may get a chance to count these animals, furthering their efforts to conserve these herds. Every year, thousands of hunters head out across Alaska to harvest caribou. These animals are an important source of food for many Alaskans. There are up to one million roaming the state in 32 different herds, some of which are made up of hundreds of thousands of animals. On average, approximately 22,000 are harvested annually, but because populations fluctuate naturally and rarely remain stable for long, biologists try to keep track of how many are in each herd. Doing so helps to ensure harvest by hunters is sustainable. With large numbers scattered across the vast landscape, counting them is a challenge. The animals are constantly on the move through some of the most remote places in Alaska. To count caribou, biologists must take aerial pictures of the herds. Timing is everything, and it's only during the hottest, buggiest time of Alaska's long summer days that all the pieces just might fall into place. When the temperatures rise and the insects become thick, caribou start to congregate in large numbers on alpine snowfields and windswept areas. They are trying to escape relentless attacks by swarms of mosquitoes, bots, and warbleflies by squeezing tightly together so less of each animal is exposed. And while there might be more caribou for insects to choose from, each individual is less likely to be affected. Biologists are waiting for the perfect conditions to come together, high temperatures for several days, insects at their peak, and large, tight groups. The team must be ready to go at a moment's notice. This may be the only chance all summer to capture the necessary aerial photos of the caribou. They must act fast. The weather could change at any time, sending the herd scattering. When it looks as though all the pieces are falling into place, Pilots take to the air in small planes to scout out their locations and behavior. But it's not easy in Alaska's vast, remote areas. Radio telemetry is used to track and find collared animals. In almost every caribou population in Alaska, Biologists have fitted some with radio collars to help find groups from the air. These VHF or GPS collars emit a signal that allows pilots to find animals and gather valuable movement and population data throughout the year. When the caribou are in large groups during the summer, finding the collared animals usually means finding most of the herd. It may take multiple scouting missions over the course of several days or even weeks to decide when they're congregated enough for the next phase of counting, calling in the camera planes. Alaska Department of Fish and Game has two airplanes, equipped with three 100 megapixel cameras that operate simultaneously with a GPS unit to allow high resolution imagery and mapping. When the call comes in, one of the on-call camera planes heads to the congregating herd under the direction of the spotter planes. While the spotter planes are out radio tracking, they're also visually searching for groups along the way. The camera plane is directed to all the large groups and smaller groups are captured using handheld cameras or simply counted directly by the crews in their spotter planes. So inside the aircraft, there's a lot going on when photography actually starts and prior to photography. Uh, once we get to a group and we're led to that group by the radio callers and the biologists that are tracking that particular group, the pilot flies a perimeter around that group of caribou and we're assessing if they're going to be photographable or not, how many uh, animals may be outside what we're going to be able to photograph in a single pass. We're trying to figure out if we need multiple transects for that group. And then once that perimeter is done, um, we start usually on an edge and we fly along and the pilot is keeping track when photography starts. He can see a flight display that shows the real-time photo footprints, so how wide a coverage we're getting and uh, whether we're not we're capturing all those caribou or not. There's other observers inside the aircraft as well. They're checking for caribou outside the coverage of our photographs. All right, we're over them. Okay. Camera off, mount locked. Uh, ended on 7575.
in the end. The goal is to photograph all the caribou in the herd as quickly as possible. Some may be missed, but most are photographed and eventually counted. While this is technically considered a minimum count, it is as close to a complete census as possible. Once the herd is photographed, it is then time to download the huge data files into the computer program. Based on GPS coordinates, the program precisely stitches all the overlapping images together and provides a seamless picture of the large groups. When the mapping portion is completed, trained staff reviews the digital images. This high-resolution imagery allows for the viewing of individuals on a computer screen and even distinguishing calves from adults. Biologists then mark every animal with a dot signifying that it has been counted. Then computer software sums all the dots on the images for a total number. It sounds simple, but keep in mind, some Alaska caribou herds have 250,000 or even 400,000 animals. It takes a lot of time and a lot of work to accomplish the counting process. The system is not a perfect one, and the team knows they may miss animals who were not part of the aggregations that day. The census team then uses statistical methods to estimate how many caribou were possibly not captured by the cameras. Depending on the herd movements, proportion of radio collars found, and weather conditions, the number not photographed may vary between 1 to 25% of the total population. By using this combination of assessments to estimate the number of caribou not captured in photographs, the team is able to achieve an accurate total population estimate. The role of statistics in any wildlife abundance survey is really to get an, a, an idea of uncertainty. How close are we to the truth? And so in a photo census, we know that we're not counting every single animal. It's not a true census in, in that sense of the word. What it is, is probably the closest thing to counting every animal in a population in the caribou uh, example. But what statistics allows us to do is understand, for example, if the herd estimate was 100,000, is that 100,000 plus or minus 10,000? Or is it 100,000 plus or minus 50,000? And that's what statistics is doing, is letting you know whether you're in the plus or minus 10,000 realm or the plus or minus 50,000 realm. Typically, uh, fish and game photo censuses are very high quality. This extensive annual effort is a collaboration between staff with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and contracted pilots around the state. The goal is to photograph the larger herds about every two years. If the herd is going through a dramatic increase or an abrupt decline, the census may be attempted each year. In some years, the factors needed to complete a census of Alaska's herd may not come together, and a census cannot be completed. Knowing herd numbers and keeping track of population trends ensures that the Department of Fish and Game can manage, conserve, and maintain harvest opportunity into the future, and trusting that herds of caribou will always have a place as one of Alaska's greatest natural resources. With that, um, without further ado, I think we're going to jump right into uh, the next presentation, which is a, a PowerPoint. And um, this is going to be Nate. You, you can you're going to introduce yourself as well, but Nate Pamford is going to give an overview of the uh, Caribou Photo Census itself, the whole thing. And he is the Photo Census Coordinator for the state for the Department of Fish and Game. So he deals with all the photo, photo censusing all the herds around the state. And um, he knows a lot about everything there is to know about the camera system and everything like that. So um, if you have questions during this presentation, keep them in mind or put them in the chat and we'll get to them um, at the end of this whole thing. Nate, you wanna, you wanna go for it? Sure, I'll get things set up here. Okay. And uh, I'm gonna give give his PowerPoint a minute to load because it's a 
such a high files or size, it takes a little bit to resolve on the screen. Does it look good on your end, Mike? Uh, it's good. Yeah, it just sharpened up right now. So yeah, looks good. Okay, so like Mike said, uh, my name is Nate Pamperin and I am the photo census coordinator for the state. Uh, I think this summer will be my 11th summer working on the photo census surveys. Uh, I started out operating the camera and then kind of slowly worked my way up. And I was fortunate enough to be involved in the photo census group uh, during the time frame we, we transitioned from film to digital. And uh, it's been a really rewarding and kind of exciting phase in the photo census survey history um, to kind of transition the technology to newer, newer and better stuff and uh, to see where it, it kind of takes the surveys and, and how much better we get at, at doing these with the new technology. So hopefully everybody was able to see the video. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time at the beginning of this talk to go over some specifics about the surveys themselves, a little bit of the history. And then I'll jump into a lot more detail about the camera systems that we use and how those work and then finish up with uh, how we actually count the animals once we get all the imagery put together. So I wanna start off with just a real brief history of the photo census surveys themselves. Uh, close as I can tell and talking to people, the real con first concerted effort to do a photo census was in the early 1960s and it wasn't 100% successful. And then from that, the, the main technique of the photo census, basically searching out these aggregations of caribou and then uh, using photography to, to capture them in planes, really was developed in the late 1960s and refined in the 1970s by Fish and Game. Early on, there was some cooperation with BLM uh, using some of their aircraft and I believe some of their cameras. So since then, the, the basic framework of the technique hasn't really changed a lot. I mean, you still have to go out there, refine the animals and photograph them. It's just some of the equipment has changed and, and uh, how we're able to find the animals. So the major advances through the years that really have brought us to where we are right now, uh, first being the radio collars. So early on, it was just VHF and those uh, probably became the most popular and started becoming used for um, tracking animals in the 1980s. There were some in the 1970s, but really for the photo census, uh, 1980s is when we first saw the use of those. In more recent decades, uh, we've seen satellite collars come on board as well as satellite collars that can relay GPS information and that can all that data can be downloaded remotely. So it gives us a much better ability to track these animals. Second uh, would be instrumentation on the planes. Uh, early on, there was no GPS and the, uh, the other thing that changed with plane instrumentation is in the 1980s, they added a radar altimeter. And basically what that does is it shoots a beam signal at the ground and then gets a return. So it tells you almost instantaneously how high above the ground you are, which is important because that is what one of the main factors affecting the scale of our photography. So when you think about, uh, how clear a picture is of the resolution of an image, um, how far above the ground we are matters, uh, the, the size of the lens on the camera, and then the, the camera itself, whether it's medium format or large format, or now with digital, uh, what the sensor size is. So that instrumentation helped us, you know, GPS, obviously navigation uh, is much easier with those. And then just the logistics of the survey itself when we're actually doing it, you know, spotter planes can read lat longs over the radio and we can punch them into the GPS and the photo plane. And so that helps quite a bit in orchestrating the survey itself. The next major breakthrough was camera automation software. And this goes even back to our film systems. Uh, the film systems that we had were large format, black and white, and they were 1940s, 50s, you know, World War II era technology. And uh, we had a programmer that worked for Fish and Game. He just recently retired, Rob DeLong, and he built uh, from the ground up uh, computer software that would trigger the cameras based on how fast we were going uh, from the GPS feed and then how high above the ground we are uh, with that radar altimeter. And so we went from before my time, they had to trigger the camera with uh, a hand plunger. Basically, every you know seven seconds, they would take a picture based on how fast they were going. And so that's how they triggered the camera in the early days. It was a totally manual process. And Rob's software uh, really automated that even under the film system and allowed, uh, in addition to triggering the camera automatically, it allowed us to see the footprints on a screen on the laptop. So we No worries. Okay, well, uh, I'll start just with the, the advances through the years. So 
The first of which was uh, radio collars. So in the beginning of the 1980s, the uh, VHF collars came into use and we started using those for photo census activities as well as other surveys. And in the recent decades, uh, satellite and GPS collars um, have come online and we've been using those. You can get that data remotely. You don't actually have to fly over the animal to, to uh, figure out where it is. So those have helped. Um, plane instrumentation, uh, GPS has, has helped us a lot, just the navigation and then being able to share waypoints with between the spotter planes and the photo planes so we can uh, more efficiently conduct the survey. And then the radar altimeter is one thing I talked about where it, uh, it's an instrument that basically tells you almost instantaneously how high above the ground you are. And that's important when we we're talking about the scale of the photograph. So um, how high above the ground you are, what kind of lens you have on the camera and then the camera itself. Are, are the three main things that uh, affect what the scale of your, your end photo is gonna be. So those, those help quite a bit. And then uh, camera automation software uh, really started being developed in the 1990s. A programmer that has since retired from Fish and Game, Rob DeLong, wrote software basically from scratch that triggered the cameras, the film cameras automatically. And based on how fast we were going from the GPS data and then how high above the ground we were. Um, so we got all of our overlap and we could see the photo footprints on a computer screen. So that went a long ways to uh, making our surveys more efficient. When we got over a group, we basically were seeing a map of where we had taken photos and where we needed to take photos still between that and then looking out the plane um, at the actual caribou groups themselves uh, really helped out. And that I think was, the main versions of that was developed in the late 1990s and that continued through um, right into the 2000s when we were still using film. And then in 2016, um, we got our first digital system. We didn't use it until 2017, but that was the transition from film to digital, which was the really the major breakthrough for us, you know, into modern times and being able to do, do more with the data that we're getting. So just on the bottom here, I have a few images. In the bottom left is a picture of the film, the film system itself. And these are like 1940s, 50s era black and white cameras. They had a big film magazine that sat on the top that held either a 250 foot roll of film or a 500 foot roll of film. So we didn't have unlimited picture taking capabilities with the film system. And uh, frequently in the larger herds, we'd have to land and reload film uh, before we could finish the survey. So. And the other issue with the film was that uh, we'd get back from a survey, you'd have these canisters of film that you'd send off and you'd have no idea, you know, as the survey was getting done, whether you were getting going to get good images or not. And so it was just this, you know, bag it up, send it off, and hopefully you get good looking prints uh, when they come back in the mail. The middle picture on the bottom is just a, uh, a scan of one of the black and white prints. They are nine inches by nine inches. And you can probably see some caribou on that. And then the picture on the bottom right is just an example of the photo footprints we used to get from that. And it's not the, the photo itself, it's just a little wireframe of, of the coverage that the photo got. So a little bit more about the survey in the video, you heard that you know Alaska has over 30 caribou herds. We don't use this photo census technique with all of the herds. We concentrate on this probably the seven biggest herds. So if you start up on the North Slope, we have the Western Arctic herd. Uh, moving to the east, there's the Teshikpuk herd. A little further to the east is the Central Arctic. And then all the way to the east is the Porcupine herd, which ranges into Canada. So we do those four herds on the slope with our system. And then in the interior, uh, we have the 40 mile herd and then the Nelchina herd. And then down in Southwest Alaska, uh, sometimes we use this system for that. A lot of the smaller herds um, in the state use a similar technique. They're just allowed, you know, they're able to use handheld cameras that get, you know, you know they're smaller groups of caribou, so you can capture those in, in one or two shots on a handheld. It's important for us to get these estimates of caribou herds because there's a, a lot of harvest that comes from these and it, it just helps us better manage that harvest if we have an idea, relatively speaking, of how, how large the herd is. And then finally, you know, we, we really owe the, the technique to the biology, the caribou themselves, and, and I guess the, the insects. Uh, this wouldn't happen if we couldn't take advantage of the post-calving groups that form um, that you saw examples of in the video. So what do we need for a, a photosensitive survey to happen or to even try to do one? Uh, first of all, we need the weather and the insect conditions for the caribou to actually aggregate to come together. 
And so that's what the, you know, the herd biologists are looking for um, starting in about mid June, you know, into late June, trying to get a, their finger on the pulse of what's happening with these groups, whether they're forming or not, and, and how things look for, for getting a photosynthesis done. When we actually get on the scene with the photo plane, what we need is we need groups with defined edges. If we can't tell where the groups start and stop, then the photography really doesn't help us because we're not getting, you know, distinct groups and, and we're able to move through the herd and figure out um, if we're getting all the groups or not. So we need defined edges on all these groups. You can see in the picture below on the bottom of the slide here, that's a really nice group. It's on snow, really easy to see the edges and very easy to take pictures of. And then the next major thing we have to do is we're, we're trying to attempt to find all the active radio collars or the radio collars that should be on live animals at the time of the survey. And before radio collars, you know, there was intensive visual searches that was that were done, and that's still done to this day, kind of in the, some of the periphery. So a combination of the radio tracking and then as well as uh, just visual searching for groups that may not have collars in them. So if we take a look at what the groups look like, you saw some of these in the in the photo census video that played in the beginning. This is a group from the Malchatna. This was just one picture from a handheld camera out the window of a plane. This is about 500 animals, and you can see it's just you know a really distinct group. There's some hiding in the bushes there off to the left, but uh, pretty easy to photograph this one. This group is a lot. Uh, more dispersed. This is a group from the Western Arctic, and it may not look like it has a defined edge, but th these animals aren't moving that much. And there's definitely a defined edge in the in the background there. And you can see, and it, it just takes more photos. But even if they're you know this large, uh, we're still able to photograph them, especially now with the digital system where we're not really limited on uh, picture capacity. And then occasionally um, we'll get these super groups. So. This is a picture from 2013 in the Western Arctic Survey. And these are tens of thousands of animals. I think this group, there was some on the edges of this, but it's close to 100,000 caribou. So from a, you know, a, a neatness perspective, uh, these are really cool groups to see. From a counting perspective, uh, this is a little bit too dense. You know, these animals are packed so tightly onto that bench above the river that they're standing flank to flank and it makes counting them really difficult. You get calves that are standing under the adult cows and uh, it's just, it, it's almost too dense to count, but it's really cool to see. And then sometimes you'll find groups of caribou uh, in places you might not expect. So this is a picture from 2017 in the Teshikpuk census. And these animals are out in a shallow lake. And we saw this multiple times on this census where I don't know if it was the temperatures or the bugs or the combination of the two, but the entire group would be completely in water. So if we think about how we do a photo census survey and what we need and compare that to traditional aerial photography, there's a couple main issues that we have to overcome trying to capture caribou in the images as opposed to what people may do in traditional aerial photography. So if we think about you know, we wanna go map a city with an aerial camera, or maybe we're gonna take some pictures of agricultural fields. You can basically plan that entire survey from your computer. Uh, you can figure out what resolution you want, how far you want the photos spaced apart. And before you walk out to the plane, you have a really good idea where you're gonna take every single photo in that survey. When we're talking about caribou and wildlife, and specifically this, you know, this photo census survey, the location of the photography of these animals is really unknown until the very last minute when the photo plane is flying around that group and we're flying that perimeter trying to figure out how we're going to how we're going to lay those photos out and uh, capture the group. So all of our flight planning is done on the fly. And in order to do that, we had to have software that was customized to control the cameras and then provide us with those real time photo footprints that not only the pilot has a display that he can he or she can see. Um, but the camera operator has to be able to see that as well. The other issue we deal with, which is uh, not very common in aerial photography, is what we're trying to capture is moving during the actual photography. So it's not bad if we can cover all the caribou that we're looking at in one pass. Um, so we can maximize the swath or what coverage the photos have on the ground. But we have to balance that resolution. So we could capture every single group we wanted to on one pass, but we'd have to go so high that we wouldn't have the resolution to actually count the animals from the imagery. So we have to balance the resolution and how much swath we get out of the camera system. The movement um, can be an issue. They can be moving so severely, especially um, if they're perpendicular to the direction that we're traveling on the flight transect. 
that we we can just stop photography there and we'll wait for them to get to a better spot and and try it again but there are times when we do do have to abort the you know particular group and wait till things get better on groups that do take more than one transect you know we're trying to optimize the overlap and i'll, I'll talk about that more in a few slides uh, but basically we want to get the group done in as few a transects as possible to minimize any problems of either double counting or missing animals uh, with groups that take more than one transect and then finally, we have to do all this and still be low enough to see caribou uh, with our naked eyes. And so we, you know, we could fly at six or 7,000 feet, but we'd have no idea what the caribou are doing below us unless it was a, just a really massive group. So most of the time we're flying these uh, surveys at about 1,500 feet above ground level. This is just a basic outline of how the survey goes and all the different steps in there. The video did a really good job of capturing the first two steps, which are the radio tracking flights and then flying the photo mission itself. Um, so we get done with the photo mission. I take hard drives out of the, the computers that are in the plane, have all the imagery on it and some other associated data. I bring all those back to the office and process the imagery. And this is sort of akin to sending off the film, the negative role with the film system to get developed. I basically go through every single image on a survey, adjust it for exposure if that's needed. If you know some of them are a little bit darker than they should be, uh, we can fix, fix that to some extent. And then do a little bit of quality control on those. And then the next step is post-processing. So we need to process the rest of the data. So we have data that's coming from GPS that we need to process a little bit and get that um, straightened out and then that helps us do the photo layout so we have thousands of images on, a, on any given survey and we need to piece all those photos together so that we have a product in the end for the last step which is counting the photos that someone can have on a computer screen and they can count basically just as one seamless image so now I'll get into some of the specifics about the camera systems themselves. We have two complete systems, one for uh, de Havilland Beaver, and then we have a Cessna 206 that we fly as well, and each have uh, basically identical systems. Each one of the camera systems has three cameras, and they're each 100 megapixels, and they're medium format cameras. And in the lower left-hand corner of this slide, you can see the three cameras um, in, a, in a rigid mount. And the two cameras that are side by side, they're angled slightly at about 19 degrees, so it's, it's partially oblique. And these two cameras have a 50 millimeter lens on them, and then the camera below that is pointing straight down, and that camera has a 90 millimeter lens on it. And I'll show you some graphics later that, uh, that describe that a little better so you can see how those uh, capture images. This whole insert that the cameras are contained in uh, goes into a stabilized mount, which is pictured in the, in the picture in the center below. And what that does is basically the airplane is very rarely flying perfectly level and straight. And so any small changes in the movement of the aircraft can be countered by this gyro stabilized mount. And it, it basically keeps the cameras pointing straight down as much as possible within certain uh, extents of movement. And so that in, uh, it really allows us to get as high a quality image as we possibly can um, by having them point straight down and then in the direction of travel. Sometimes if you get a real big crosswind, the plane is crabbing slightly. And so the gyro stabilized mount um, through data that's being fed to it knows the direction we're traveling in, not necessarily the direction that the no plane's nose is pointed in. So it keeps the cameras going straight ahead. Next, uh, we have a survey grade GPS and an IMU or an inertial measurement unit. And the IMU, the job of that uh, device is to measure the plane's attitude. So it's not altitude, not how high we are, but the attitude. So uh, where the plane is pointing in terms of pitch, roll, and yaw on the three axes that the plane can move. And that helps us piece the photos together, which I'll talk a little bit uh, later about. And then in order to make all this stuff work, since our surveys are so much different than traditional aerial photography, we needed advanced flight management software. And that just a screenshot is posted here in the bottom right. And there was a, a video of that in the in the opening um, video that you guys saw. So what this does is it plots the, the real time photo footprints that we're taking. And there's two colors here. There's pink and green. So when we have to come back and do another transect, the green is basically a guide for our overlap. So the pilot can see when we start taking pictures, if it's the next line is the 
is a, the pink shape against the pink shape, that means we're at proper overlap. And it's just a visual cue that the pilot can use to make sure that we're not missing any caribou or we're not having too much overlap. So we're flying as efficiently as possible. And then this software also gives the pilot uh, graphical information that's really easy to pick up on. Um, this is a, a target altitude bar. So if we go below that, it changes colors. And then if we go above that, if we get too high above the ground, um, the color changes to alert the pilot that he needs to uh, bring the airplane up or down accordingly. And then a bunch of different information about um, where we are in terms of the beginning of the, the photos that we started taking. So that's kind of in the plane while we're doing the photography. And then in the end, uh, we have another software program that we use to actually stitch the images together. So that's, that's kind of the final step. So if we look at, take a look at the photo footprints in a little bit more detail, I pointed out in the previous slide that, that we have two 50 millimeter cameras and those have a little bit of their setup. So they have a little bit of overlap in the middle. It's about 10 or 15% of the image overlaps. So we get kind of this bow tie shape composite image out of those two. And the reason that it has its shape is because the plane is flying right here. So th these are the portion of the photos that's directly under the plane. But as we go outward towards the edge of that oblique photo, um, it's getting farther away from the plane. And so the, the resolution is actually decreasing the farther you get from the plane. Well, that makes sense. And the swath is, is just the width of the photo in terms of measurement on the ground. So if we're flying, like I said, most of the time at about 1500 feet above the ground, our swath on the 50 millimeter images is about 3,700 feet for both of these combined. So uh, about two thirds of a mile. Resolution in aerial photography is, is given in terms of ground sample distance or GSD. And it's basically, if you zoomed into one of our images until all you could see was the individual pixels, it's how big one of those pixels are on the ground. So if we're flying at 1500 feet, the center of this image has pixels that are about four centimeters on a side. Since the edge of the photo is farther away, the resolution goes down to about 11 centimeters per pixel. And then this just scales up. So if we flew at 3000 feet, our swath is gonna be 7,400 and then the resolution um, goes down accordingly. Just to talk about a few more specifics on, on surveys where we have to fly more than one transect for a group. So you can see here, I just um, annotated this to show where the footprint of the 90 millimeter camera is. And then again, where the 50 millimeter cameras fall. So uh, one thing we have to keep in mind is overlap among the photos that are on a flight line and that's called end lap. And that's for our surveys typically is about 60%. And then if we have to take another pass um, to catch the rest of the group, we also have side lap to deal with, or that's the amount of overlap between adjacent flight lines. And for us, uh, we try to limit that to about 30 or 40% so that we can um, capture the group totally, but we don't overdo any, uh, to have too much overlap so that we have to fly an additional transect. So now we get into the point where we need to try and tie these photos together. And so we need a little bit more information and we need to combine all this information together. So obviously we need the imagery that we've taken with the cameras. We need the GPS location, um, which we get a GPS location multiple times per second. And then we have that inertial data, which is the same. So we're getting multiple times per second, we're getting the readings of pitch, roll and yaw, which direction the aircraft is facing. So we combine all this information along with information about the cameras themselves. So the sensor size and then the lens property. So the lens is a curved piece of glass and naturally it's gonna have distortion. And for our cameras, they're all metric cameras. So we have a distortion model for that curved piece of glass and the lens that we can apply with this other data. And what this allows us to do is basically translate that digital image into sort of the true ground space that it's supposed to occupy. There's a lot of fancy geometry involved and all of this um, is handled by the software. Um, but that's basically how we uh, gather all this information together and then process an image so that it comes out to where it should be on the ground. So this process is you know, broadly known as photogrammetry. Um, and one of the main principles of photogrammetry is that if we take images at different locations, so you can see this is camera position one, we fly a little bit longer and we take another um, image at camera position two. Well, we know 
with a high degree of accuracy where we've taken those two photos. And we know that there's overlap between those two photos. And so we capture a portion of the ground, um, the same portion of the ground in both images. And even though these images are two dimensional themselves, if you combine them together and with a, a lot of fancy geometry, uh, you can actually extract 3D information from the two dimensional images. So this is just an example of two images themselves. Um, but if we scale this up to you know, a full survey or a mapping project, each one of these green disks shows where a photo has been taken. And there's overlap, both side lap and end lap. And what that allows us to do is feed it into software that calculates where all those identical points are between the overlapping images. And those are called tie points. So here in this image, you can see that there's kind of some red shading. Those are all the different photo footprints from the three different cameras. And then again, each green disk shows where a photo has been taken. In this case, there's three photos taken at each disk, one from each 50 millimeter camera and then one from the 90. All these lines that are crisscrossing this just show that this camera or these images have tie points with all the other ones that are connected by lines. And so you can see it's basically just like a big web of information once it's all processed in and how all the photos fit together. So once that step is done, once we have all the tie points generated, uh, we can actually build a 3D model of the, the terrain that we just flew over. So we get back to the office, process all this data, create the tie points, and we get this 3D model, which is called a digital elevation model. And this is what we use to overlay the individual photos onto and then create that seamless mosaic. So you can see here, you don't see any edges of the images. It's, it all looks just like one picture. So that's the end goal. And that's really what we're trying to do to get to the point where we're counting the caribou. So that was a lot of explanation on how we do the ortho rectification, the process of you know, putting these photos on the ground in the space that they need to be in. And I'm just going to play a little animation here of the process in action with the software. It's just a little screen recording. So you can see here we're processing one of the 50 millimeter images, and it's coming down one side. And you can see the 3D terrain. And the images, the, basically the best way to think about it is you're draping each image over all of the, you know, the different topography that we've flown over. So we finished up the first line here, and this is just you know five or six images. Um, but imagine this happening at a scale of a group, you know, a large group of caribou that has you know 200 or 300 images in it. This is the process that's going on to register each individual photograph. So we got a couple more images coming on this other side, and then once it finishes up, I'll, I'll pan around in the software just so you can see a little bit better the terrain that they're overlapping. So that's basically a visual on, on the ortho rectification process or, or how we you know, get those uh, images into real space on the ground. So the goal of that process is to get individually um, registered images. And then the last step is to basically put those all into a mosaic. And this is what we're gonna count. So this image here shows the mosaic underneath of a big group of caribou from the Western Arctic Survey. And then the yellow lines are the seam lines. So this shows what portion of the 50 millimeter photos were used in the final mosaic. And I have control of this in the, in the mosaic process. So I can drag this line to the left or to the right if I want more of this image and less of this image or vice versa. And then the black lines are the seam lines of the 90 millimeter images. So you can see when someone's counting these images, um, they don't necessarily have the seam lines on there. I just put these on here so you can see how the final mosaic is made up of portions of all those individual photos. So now I've described how all that works with the digital system. I wanted to take a step back in time and, and show you what it was like with the film process. We didn't extract the 3D information from the film prints like we do with the digital photos, but a lot of what we do with the digital photos, we had to do the same thing with uh, for film. So on a film survey, we'd get the film back uh, from the developer two, three weeks after we um, sent it off for processing. We'd get a bunch of these nine inch by nine inch prints back. And then a biologist would have to sit there either on a gym floor or a big table like you see here in these pictures and lay each group out so that the photos um, in a particular group were all laid out basically how they were taken. 
the difficult thing with the film photographs is that it's impossible to fly the same altitude above the ground on, on all these flights. And with the film, you're restricted. I mean, the, the prints come back nine inches by nine inches, regardless of whether you flew one flight line 100 feet higher than the next. And so the layout process was manual and it was a little bit tricky because if, if the scale of the photos was off just enough, it was harder to recognize um, identical points on the ground. So once they got all these laid out, um, a person would take a Sharpie and they would go on each individual photograph and delineate or mark out which portion of each photo was to be counted. So that's basically the same thing as the mosaic process with the digital photos where you're only using a portion of each photo because they're overlapped by photos behind it and in front of it and then to the side. So once the layout was done with the film photos, uh, we would usually lay out a clear grid over the top of them. So it just, it, um, organize the photo better for counting. And then lots of people would spend lots of time with bright lights and magnifying glasses and hand loops looking at these uh, printed images and counting all the caribou. And then each counter would flip the photo over when they were done and write their count on the back and then move on to the next photo. So if we go back into how the digital system works, uh, once we process out these photo mosaics, uh, we use a geographic information software or GIS to um, have these photos come up on a computer screen. And then uh, we have a custom tool um, that was developed with Inside Fish and Game where a counter can use uh, key combinations and mouse clicks to basically add different categorized points. So you can see here in this image, the green dots are for calves and then the red dots are for adults. So very quickly, um, someone can get started annotating an image. What's not quick is you have hundreds and hundreds of these images, and if for a big herd that has three or 400,000 animals, the counting takes quite a while. The other issue with film is that the counts, um, really the only archive we had was the number written on the back. We couldn't take an individual photo and say, okay, you know, counter A thought this was a calf, thought this was an adult. But with the digital system, while the person, while the counter is dropping points on the map, um, the software is capturing what they're doing. So for each drop uh, point that they drop on the map, we basically get a spreadsheet that has whether the person thought it was an adult or a calf, who the counter was, the date and time of the photographs and when the counting happened, uh, what the group name was based on the name of the image. And then if they were counting caribou off the 90 millimeter or the 50 millimeter imagery. So a lot more information can get archived now that we have the digital photos and it just makes for a better overall system. I put this slide up just to show people sort of the spectrum of, uh, you know, ground types or substrates that we photograph these caribou on. Some of them are really easy to count and some of them can be really difficult. On the upper left, you can see a photo of, uh, you know, just a handful of caribou on a snow patch. Uh, they're really easy to count. The contrast is good. Compare that to a photo where you have lots of caribou on a snow patch and then shadows start getting more challenging. You know, calves like to be tucked up tight to some of the uh, cows. So that gets tricky. Again, pictures of them in water, that's not too bad. Uh, where it really gets challenging is down here in the lower left where you sort of have these mixed tundra patches with talus, you know, rocks that are the same color and shape and shadow uh, that caribou have. And then substrate like rocks that are almost the same exact color as the back of a caribou and it gets uh, really challenging to count some of these photos, especially when the caribou are very dense. But since we have digital images now, one of the things we can start doing is uh, examining other ways to count rather than having people sit there and click uh, on a computer. So I'm sure a lot of folks out there that are watching tonight have heard about artificial intelligence or computer vision and all the different things that that's been used for. And it's no different really for caribou. And it's just their caribou are a certain size and shape in an image. And what we can do is annotate those images and basically draw boxes around adults and calves. And we do that thousands and thousands of times. And we train a computer model to then recognize what it thinks is a caribou and what isn't a caribou. And so this is just a, a quick example. Uh, it's this, another screen capture video here. So I'll start this. And basically you feed the software an image and you hit count. And this is in real time, the recording I did a few days ago. 
So it's only going to take 20 or 30 seconds, and then it's going to come up with a count um, of caribou in this particular image. So we waited a little while, and the computer came up with a little over 9,300 caribou. So now we're going to zoom in, and we're going to see if, uh, if it missed any or if it double counted them, and then see how well the software actually did. We're almost getting to the point where we can see the individual animals and each one of those little circles has a number in it out of the 9300, um, the order in which it was counted. So I can start annotating it with these red boxes to show caribou that it missed. So you can see it missed an adult, handful of calves, another adult, and then down here, uh, this bull, it actually double counted. So it got the body, put a mark there, but then the antler was the right color maybe the right shape. Um, so that was annotated as another caribou. Obviously that's wrong. You can see the vast majority of these uh, missed animals are calves. And so over time we can annotate more and more images and hopefully get a better model. These models are never gonna be 100%. They'll never be as good as human. And the idea though is to, be, to become more efficient now that we have the digital data so that we can feed a uh, computer system these images and get sort of that first cut of counting done and then go back in, you know, have staff members do this where we could just clean the image up, you know, delete double counts, add missed calves. And so the, the time taken to get a count in the end uh, should be much less. And we're currently in, you know, there's multiple software packages that can do this. And we're, we're investigating a few at this point. This is just one of the examples that's it's worked out the best so far um, of what we've tried. And so it's definitely not a done deal where we can just feed it any image and, and we get a perfect count, but it's one of the things we're working towards um, to speed things up. Because in a traditional census, sometimes, you know, we the herd manager might really want an estimate before that falls hunting season. And so we'd only have, you know, if we do a photo census in July, we just have a short amount of time to try and count all the photographs, do all the statistics and come up with an estimate. And then this is my last slide. I always get a lot of questions on why we don't use drones. Um, and so this is just one particular example of a Western Arctic survey in 2019 that uh, at least to me answers that question fairly well on why we don't use drones. And, and when I'm talking about drones here, it's mainly like the consumer level or professional level drones. I'm not talking about you know military grade predators uh, that you'd be flying from the office. So the scale here from east to west, um, you know, this survey covered close to 200 miles. And so with a fixed wing aircraft, we can, you know, land once and refuel and basically have this survey done in less than a day with either our 206 or the Beaver. If we were to do this with drones, um, we'd have to charter a helicopter, find the group, land the helicopter, deploy the drone. And then since the drone can't handle as much of a payload as far as camera weight goes, the camera would probably only be one camera and a lot um, less resolution than the cameras that we use. And so you'd have to do multiple transects and then you deal with battery life. And none of this is taken into account any sort of um, coordination with the FAA, which would have to happen to fly at heights we would need to capture the groups. And so at this point, um, that's kind of why we, we haven't used drones for these types of surveys, just because of the scale we're working at. It's much more efficient to use traditional fixed wing photography. And if I had to guess right now, I would say before, you know, um, we would use drones on these surveys, my guess is that satellite imagery would become good enough that we'd, we'd actually be using that instead of drones or even fixed wings. So uh, that's all the slides I had. And I'm going to hand things back over to Mike. And he's got a couple more things to show you. All right. Thanks, Nate. Um, we got a lot of questions starting to pile up in the chat, and those are there's a bunch of good questions in there. We'll get to um, some of them were not answered in the presentation, but um, before we do that, I'm going to share my screen again and show a short video about um, the 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 Haviland Beaver and Tom talking about the Beaver, and then give Tom a chance to talk about um, flying the photo census for the last many years that I know about. So. Here we go with one more video.
Well, we've chosen the 1951 de Havilland beaver for our photosynthesis uh, work. And the reason why is, is there's really never been a better bush plane, uh, you know, created. And it hauls a heavy load so we can take, you know, pilot, crew, camera, and all their gear for a week's work at a, you know, at a uh, caribou aggregation. Work the whole period, never run out of supplies have all, everything we need, and uh, we get, it goes fairly fast across country, you know, we can go 120, 130 miles an hour, but when we want to slow down above the caribou aggregations to take really good photos, uh, we can slow it down to 60, 70 miles an hour, no problem, and it's just a really stable platform. It's, it's a heavy airplane, so it, it flies real stable and just a little bit of turbulence and things like that, so it's a, it's a perfect aircraft for the, for the job. Okay, um, Tom, I don't know if you want to talk at all about flying any surveys. So you, I think you've probably been doing this longer than any pilot now um, that's still with the department. Sure, yeah, I, I think, you know, this, this presentation is pretty technical, but I think it's one of the important things to remember from my perspective is that it's one of the greatest wildlife spectacles in the world. You know, Alaska has some really amazing uh, wildlife to view and to and to enjoy. But to see a half a million or even a hundred thousand or fifty thousand large ungulates like this all get together uh, on one day and and be able to view them, it's uh, it's it's quite a spectacle. And so that's kind of uh, what I really enjoy out of it, uh, beside the technical parts. Um, I think I'll just kind of stop there. There's probably there's a lot of questions to be answered. I wrote a couple of notes down. I saw somebody asked early on, what are the things that cause the caribou to group up? And Nate hit that a little bit. Um, I think the reality is we don't really know for sure um, what makes them group up, but we have a good idea. Um, and I think it kind of boils down to three kind of components. Um, the first one is, is a social part of the reason why they grow up and that that's kind of their post calving aggregation so they they all kind of split spread out somewhat to calve but then they all kind of group up after that and we think there's some a social component to that the next thing is insect harassment from bugs like nate mentioned um you know the worse the bugs generally uh the better they group up and caribou are harassed by all kinds of different bugs and so um it's not just the mosquitoes that uh, that, that harass the, us there's other bugs too um, and then hot, still weather really matters. So if there's any kind of wind, it can blow the, uh, blow the bugs off the caribou and give them some ease. But so the perfect, the very best conditions, like the days that we get the really good photosynthesis are hot, buggy, clear skies with no wind and for several days in a row. And that's kind of, hopefully that answers that question. Okay. Um, yeah, so I guess we may as well start we can start going through the questions. I'm gonna I'm gonna show two slides real quickly before people start leaving, and then we could start scrolling through these questions and answering questions with while Tom and Nate are here with us. So give me one second here. Let me do one more screen share. Uh, mostly, I just want to point out for everybody out there in the audience that um, other caribou resources that we have, we have lots of caribou resources, and mo most all of them are on our website on the Alaska Department of Fish and Game website. You can look under species, caribou, other resources. We have generally um, newsletters about all, updated newsletters about all the major herds. Uh, we also have species profile pages, um, things about uh, meat salvage requirements, how to identify male and female caribou. Um, and also we have, a, we have a caribou disease booklet that's coming up in the next month or two probably that's gonna be completed. So. We have that stuff on there, so please um, check out those resources. We also have on Monday, April 5th, Dr. Beckman, our wildlife health veterinarian, is going to give a presentation at 7 o'clock about caribou diseases, um, their impacts on the, on the caribou themselves, on the herds, and then also cautionary measures for people um, and pets as well. So hopefully everybody can join us for that presentation. <clears throat> 
And with that, I think we can just start going through some questions. Unless uh, Jen or Sierra, you have anything else that I missed maybe? Yeah, so um, I'd like to pipe in about a, a couple other presentations just before we do those folks and hopefully folks will stay tuned in and ask um, questions and engage here with Nate and Tom. But um, we also, aside from the caribou presentation, we have, we're just busting out all of these virtual presentations this spring and we hope you'll join us also for Wildlife Wednesday while it is virtual. Um, Next Wednesday, we will have Dr. Jeff Stetz, who's a fish and game research coordinator, take a closer look at bear rubbing behavior and its use in population monitoring and potential bias in research design. So I'm going to drop a link for that um, and you can just click away and register for that tonight as I did the um, caribou diseases in Alaska with Dr. Kimberly Beckman. If you wanna just sign up so while it's on your mind and that will be done. And just as a side note, um, after this three-part series on caribou, we do hope to have some specific herd updates given by research and management biologists. So um, stay tuned for that. And if you aren't a Facebook user, um, you can all look at the Fishing Game. What, um, we've got an event calendar. So just in the search bar, when you go to Fishing Game's website, just look up event calendar and uh, you'll see upcoming talks there. And I can also drop a link now. So thank you. Okay. Um, I'm gonna skip the comments about Nate's beard and go right to the real questions. Uh, so here's one, the average number of transects per herd, you know, and that's obviously quite variable um, depending on the herd size and their aggregations and stuff. But what, what do you got? Yeah, so my, my guess is that question, maybe they were asking how many transects per group possibly. And so the vast majority now that we're running the digital system, um, when we're talking about, you know, kind of the average size herd, basically, uh, a lot of the times it's only one transect, you know, two, you know, maybe two transects, probably 20, 15 or 20 percent of the groups. Uh, big herds like the Western Arctic or the Porcupine. Sometimes, you know, we'll have multiple groups that'll take lots, you know, transects. We're talking like five or six, but five or six transects with this digital system was like 15 or 20 with the film system. And so it's, it's still manageable. We still like to get, you know, transects, just, you know, one transect per group. It just makes everything that much easier and the movement isn't quite as much of an issue. But uh, yeah, the vast majority are just are one transect. Okay. Um, yeah, so the whole herd isn't all necessarily all together in one group. There's, they're in multiple groups, so it's not just one pass through the whole herd. Um, since you have to fly over the herd low, you know, not that low, but does it ever scatter the herd? Yeah, so the, the Beaver is a pretty loud airplane. It's got a big radial engine, and uh, it's definitely making noise. And the same, you know, with the 206, it's got a different engine, but they're still loud. And the caribou are already sort of, you know, on edge because of the bugs. And so, you know, to, we'll occasionally see them react to the plane a little bit. It was a little more common in the film system because of the film system, we were flying at about 1,000 feet above the ground, and now we're half again as high at 1,500. And so... Um, it's less noticeable now that we're running the digital system, we're flying higher, but yeah, these, these animals are already on edge. And so, you know, it, it doesn't take much to, to kind of get them to pay attention, but, uh, it's, it's definitely less, less of an issue with the digital system for sure. Okay. And there's many, many groups that we fly over that caribou are just bedded or feeding and there's no response to, um, you know, sometimes, this a time of day when they're not as agitated as they sometimes are because of bugs and things like that. So it, it's variable. Okay. Um, somebody has a comment here. I would love to, have, <clears throat> I would have loved to see this type of information and process in my JS course during my degree. Um, does Fish and Game ever reach out to their needs for future generations or current needs in the industry with local universities? Like, I don't know if they, I don't know about that one. So I, I guess I haven't, I haven't been asked or haven't, you know, uh, initiated anything to go give talks to any of the GIS courses, say like here at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, but we, it, as far as like designing the system, you know, we worked with a professor from a university that had experience doing 
um, similar types of surveys. And so we've, we've worked with folks from universities doing that. And then in the automated counting research, I've interacted with a number of different folks from other universities and, you know, have data sharing agreements with people that want to try the automated counting um, with their particular model. And so we, we do interact with universities in that respect. Okay. Um, another one, is there any other photogrammet pro photogrammetric uh, information taken from the images such as size, like caribou size? that is utilized or is it only used to piece together the information? So the, the main thing we use it for in Caribou is, is to get the images pieced together um, so we can count them. And, but once the images are ortho rectified, you can take measurements from them. And in the oblique portions of those photos, uh, some of the measurements can get a little bit off. It's less accurate way out there, especially if you don't have um, a line a line of photos to the to the side of it so if it's your last photo line those far oblique portions of the photos can get a little skewed but um yeah once we process a, an ortho mosaic uh you can take measurements on the animals and um i can let tom describe a little bit what uh, some of the work we've been doing with bison but yeah you can take measurements you know see how long they are and all sorts of stuff uh, you can do that and i'll let tom talk about the bison work yeah, that's super useful with bison. You know, photosensors can be applied to other species too. Um, and since I'm, you know, the wood bison project biologist, we spend a lot of time uh, doing photosensors on wood bison. And then I can uh, classify all the animals in a group to uh, their age class or their sex. You know, like an adult bull is much larger than a, than a two-year-old or even an adult cow. There's so much sexual dimorphism there. And you can do the same thing with caribou too. And so, it, you know, as, as time goes on, this is pretty new technology for us just in the last few years. And so as time goes on, it's gonna get more applications into, into other species, but having, being able to measure things in the photo is, is very fruitful for us. Okay, <clears throat> um, another question. I don't know if anybody wants to tackle this here. Um, might be better for one of the biometricians, but what statistical methods do you use to account for missed groups of an, or animals? So you guys want to talk about Reve or just? I can, I can just, that? I can mention it real quick. I mean, so if the Lincoln talked a little bit about it in the, in the video. So if you go back to that YouTube link, he can, he describes, you know, on a basic level, what we're trying to do, but there's a paper written by some Canadians, I think it was in the late nineties. And the, the main author, the last name is Reve. It's R I V E S T. And they basically just came up with a method of trying to estimate those, how many caribou are represented by those collars that you don't find. So if you knew you had 100 collars in a herd that should be alive at the time of the survey and you only find 95 of them, basically it fills out the rest of that curve and how many animals are represented by those other five collars. And so in a nutshell, that's basically what it is. But in, in fish and game world, you know, we call it the Reve method. And, and for most of the large herds that group up well, uh, we use that to statistically estimate what portion we may have missed. Okay. Um, yeah, so another question. We will have these, all these presentations are um, recorded and we're, we have them on our ADF&G YouTube channel. And we also have an ADF&G Vimeo channel. We have the presentations listed in both of those places takes a couple of days to get them uh, rendered and put up there. So they're all, they're all there. Um, another question, um, how accurate is the AI counter? Not yeah, very, I, apparently. <laughs> I forgot to uh, for mention that. So the, the little video I showed of the screen capture um, of that software running, that it counted 9,363 animals. The, the human count for that photo was 10,200 and something. So it missed about a thousand animals or a combination of double counting and missing whatever. But, uh, and it seems like that particular model, that algorithm, that company developed for us um, by sending them photos and us providing a bunch of annotations is about in that range. It's, you know, anywhere from about five to 15%, which if it saves you hours and hours of counting, um, then that's still a net gain for us. Uh, it's just, it takes a lot to work in that new technology to how we're, um, currently counting them, but uh, it's it shows real promise. Okay. Um, I think we're covered most of the caribou questions. Tom, there is one about wood bison if you want to feel the wood bison question. Uh, <laughs> sure, what is it? Uh, 
just the current population size of the wood bison herd and is it growing to expectations? We, we do have updates on our website, by the way, Dave. And also we put Facebook posts up there about quarterly about herd updates for the wood bison, just FYI. Uh, yeah, I'll answer it real short because it's off subject. You can email me directly and I'll, I'll talk to you even more. But uh, yeah, last summer uh, we did a population estimate and came up with about 94 animals. Uh, and we had nine calves total um, last summer. Uh, right now it's about the same. I think last week we still had eight of those nine calves that we saw. Um, the winter was pretty good. We had low snow conditions for most of the winter and things were looking really good. But in the last week or two, there's just been lots and lots of snow down there. And so I'm really hoping that uh, it melts fast because what we've kind of learned over the last few years is that um, the snow conditions in April kind of sets the the survival for the year because that's when um we have the most trouble with survival and productivity is is when there there's deep hard snow in april right now the snow is still real soft there so anyway i won't spend too much time on that in a caribou talk but uh okay um they're uh they've they're not growing to we didn't have an expectation it was experimental herd and but there's they are established and they're they're still living and uh, we'll see how they come out of this in about a month <clears throat> okay um, are there volunteer opportunities? Um, I'm assuming that means for the photo census. Um, probably not, I would imagine, for that. But uh, you guys want to answer that? Yeah, I mean, in general, since, since I've been involved, uh, it's all been fish and game staff. Um, we try to get people that have been on these surveys before. And so, yeah, for these types of surveys, there's not much room in the beaver. You know, we can take four people in that basically. Two of those are the pilot and the camera operator, and then two additional observers to look out the side and, and take notes. And the 206, it's the pilot and the camera operator, and the camera takes up the rest of the room in the back. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, there's there's not a whole lot of uh, volunteer opportunities for this type of work. It's pretty intense uh, on a on a photo day um, when we're actually doing a photo census. You know, we have to have uh, cockpit silence unless it's you know anything not associated with the photo census business because there's a lot of communication going on within the airplane and and outside the airplane to the spotter planes. And so, uh, I think a volunteer might not enjoy themselves that much because it's uh it's real business where you're working really hard to accomplish something yeah plus the fact that you have to be on call because you you never know when you're going to go so you have to be on call like for i don't know for you guys probably a month of the summertime yeah nate and i lose our midsummer from mid-june to mid-july uh you know all the good king salmon fishing and stuff like that uh, <laughs> but uh you know, and the pay is the, the, the great spectacles of caribou we get to see. Um, here's a question. What does the department think its future needs are to meet demand of herd changes and harvest? Hmm. Um, that's an interesting question. Basically, I mean, for us right now, it's, you know, just keep the systems running, you know, keep the airplanes up, keep uh, pilots in the planes if we can. And, you know, we used to have two pilots. Uh, one of them was our, our director and and uh, he left state service. And so we're down to one pilot now. So that that hampers us a little bit. But yeah, in the future, it's just it's keeping the technology we have working. And uh, and then in the future, you know, investigating possibilities that any way we could do it more efficiently and, and you know, the weather and the bugs and the caribou have to cooperate, you know, to, to get the surveys done. That's really the, the crux of it all is for those groups mm -hmm. to form. Uh, but basically, it's, you know, keep up what we're doing now and hopefully we get, you know, censuses when we need them and we have the people to do it. Yeah, and herd, herd sizes change all the time and harvest changes all the time, you know, and that can be dependent on the herd size. So just getting the numbers of caribou um that's going to change all the time so again the numbers is really important to help um, manage that yeah and we I, it was mentioned in the video too but just to reiterate that uh you know this these groupings don't happen for every herd every single year um and when they do you know they might last a day or two so if people aren't on the ball and, and monitoring these herds really closely um your opportunity can come and go and you know we've 
like the 40 mile herd, we struggle to get that one. They just don't seem to group up um, quite as well as maybe they used to, or maybe something's changing. But, you know, last survey we got was 2017 on the 40 mile. And before that, I think the last good census we got was in 2010. So there, you can go long periods of time, even though you're monitoring these herds closely before you get, you know, another photo census. So you just, you got to keep trying. Um, Nate, you mentioned the satellite work possibly in the future, you know, has the department uh, showed any like interest in that at all, or have you brought it to anybody? Um, we've, I've looked into it uh, be, because of requests from other people, you know, they're interested to see if that, that's possible. So for us now in the systems that we have, we feel like we can count calves reliably and adults and we can distinguish the two, you know, but anywhere between about three to six or seven centimeter resolution imagery. Like the very best satellite imagery that you can get right now, at least easily is, you know, 30 centimeters. And so you can see caribou in 30 centimeter imagery, but you're not going to get an accurate count from it. And then there's a lot of logistical challenges with uh, the satellites, you know, is there cloud cover? Well, you're not going to get a, a natural color image from a satellite if there's cloud cover in between it and the caribou. So you'd have to have clear weather days um, to get that stuff. And just right now, the biggest hurdle is the resolution just isn't there. And then, you know, the problems with acquiring the imagery, the cost of it, those are all hurdles that we'd have to overcome. But the main thing right now is just the resolution. Okay. And that kind of answers the next question that it was in there um, just about taking uh, less photos from high quality photo from higher elevation or from a satellite. So I think they're both fall into that resolution category. Like it's not, not high enough to get the cows that we need. Yeah. And so, you know, the higher up you go, the more coverage you get, but the way the caribou are moving um, or the, the way they can be moving during the survey itself, uh, the way our survey works now, we kind of have to be able to see the groups uh, with our eyes to figure out if we need to stop and restart or if we're missing some portion of the group. And so um, the way it works now is, you know, we have to sort of balance that, the resolution, the system that we have and how high we can fly and, uh, and just balance all those factors out. So the, in the future, you know, if satellite imagery got to a point where it was better resolution and you'd have clear weather to get the images from, um, and you could direct the satellites to, to get the coverage, take the images where you wanted them, when you wanted it, you know, that'd be a possibility. You wouldn't necessarily have to see individual groups of caribou because we have satellite and GPS collars that we know basically real time or within a very short amount of time where those animals are. So it's, it's feasible, at least in a theoretical sense, that someday satellite imagery may work. Okay. Well, I think that's about all we have, you know, unless um, you guys have anything you want to say to end it. Um, that's all that's all that we have and um there's a lot of comments in the chat that i'll share with you guys too um oh and we have a poll to throw up there as we depart if people want to answer the poll a lot of people are starting to leave now so uh if you can answer this poll question about other topics of interest for future presentations this you know this would help us out a little bit And just a thing, I'd like to thank these guys for coming and doing this tonight. It's very much appreciated, and I think there's a lot of interest in it. And um, now we have this recorded, so we can people can watch it anytime and share it with other folks. So thank you, Tom and, uh, and Nate. You're welcome. Yeah, for sure. It was fun.